I am not judged by the number of times I fail, but by the number of times I succeed. And the number of times that I succeed is in direct proportion to the number of times I fail and keep on trying. That is a mantra that came into my head when I was 24 and a young emerging salesman on Wall Street. And I read a book called How to Master the Art of Selling by a sales guru named Tom Hopkins. The most startling part of the book to me was not just the tactics that it taught me about how to sell, it was the fact that there was even a guru out there that wrote a book that taught me to sell. And when I think about all the other gurus out there, there's a lot of them. But there's one in particular that I came to learn about throughout the course of my own evolution, and he is our guest today. Welcome to A Climb to the Top, Stories of Transformation. I'm Chuck Garcia on Talk Radio 77 WABC, and my guest today is named Barry Farber. To try to summarize Barry's bio is a challenge because he has accomplished a lot of things, and he is positioned in the marketplace as he helps people in the service of their success that he is an entrepreneur, he is a coach, he is a trainer, he is an agent, he is a TV and radio personality. He is also a best-selling author for a, many books, I think 12 altogether. One of them is called Success Secrets of Sales Superstar. And if you think that isn't enough, you got to see this pen. Now, I know for those on the radio, you don't have a visual on it, but Barry can also count himself as an inventor. Barry Farber, welcome to A Climb to the Top. Oh, quite an introduction. Very nice. I, I appreciate I, it. I hope you do because I think nice of you. Nice to be here with you. Thank you very much, and I'm, I'm really glad you're here. I think of you as a guru, and I can't think of any other one word as an umbrella. And I know in your, your humble, self-effacing manner, you may, call this, you may not refer to yourself that way, but let's begin there. What are you? Well, when somebody said to me once, if you see Buddha on the road, run. You know, ever claim to be a you know-everything guru, it's a scary thing to say. But, Indeed. That's and, why I'm uh, very careful about it. <laughs> and I appreciate that. It's an honor to be on this show. I think it's really cool what you're doing with Climb to the Top. I love the whole theme. Thank you. Um, but I think what's most important is the ability not to be afraid to fail, what you started with. You know, failure is not an option. You have that faith and belief. But I'm telling you something, even with this pen, and, you know, one of the things, you hear that snapping? That was a mistake in the manufacturing, you know? And then people started catching on. And it was addictive. But... I've taken this pen. This pen is almost a metaphor to about the fact that it's flat and you unfold it and then it snaps together. And, you, and, and the only way to, to succeed, the only way I believe in something challenging is to see something as an obstacle and, and just attack it. Attack it, you're going to fall, you're going to fail, you're going to have setbacks, obstacles, you're going to have a lot of things in your way. But the funny thing is when you get up and utilize that intelligent action, that action that allows you intelligence to be able to move forward much more efficiently the next time, it's amazing. It's amazing why I see people say, how would that person succeed? They say, you know, a person has no talent, whatever. They just never gave up. They just never stopped trying and coming back with new ideas to make themselves more efficient in their actions. So I'm a big believer in that, you know, the failure part, you got to just take it. You got to understand that, that there's no way to succeed without it. Um, and if you do, it's the one hit wonder where you don't appreciate how you got there. Well, let, let's examine um, just some of your past so we can figure out how you came to be many of those things. Where did it begin for you, your career? What did you do at the <laughs> onset before all these twists and turns and wonderful things? Well, it, 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 one of the events in my life was working with um, Evil Knievel and working with one of the longest, Trigger Gum, the longest motorcycle Guinness Book of World Records jumps to World champ, 10-time world champion, Andy McDonald, skateboarder. And um, for our younger viewers, let's just say, maybe the millennials will know Evil Knievel. I, I don't know. Hmm. Let's assume they don't. Explain him, because we grew up with him. <laughs> well, Evil Knievel is really the first one to bring action sports to the, to the television. I mean, he literally was leaping over cars and buses with a motorcycle that today most of these... Um, uh, daredevils wouldn't even dare go on because it wasn't made for jumping. So um, he was doing things out of the box and, and uh, with nobody to follow. He was the originator of, of, of extreme sports, um, and action sports. And what part sports. did you play in either the promotion or the development of an evil Knievel or others? Well, I met him several ways, one through his bodyguard, but um, it was to sell. First, it was to uh, get a, uh, 
uh, roller coaster built in his name, and we built it with Six Flags. It was a $7 million roller coaster that launched in um, 2008. But I w you asked me how it started. Yeah, where did it begin so we don't lose track of that? I, I want to tell you that, you know, my thrill when I was a kid, I used to love BMX and jumping my bike and skateboarding. And there was something about my father helped me build a ramp to jump over 10 garbage cans. Now, most Parents Not would in 2020. Say, you know, you know maybe, maybe people would say, you know, maybe your father didn't like you too much. <laughs> but um, no, no, you, you know, back then, you know, I wore a football helmet and I was jumping over these garbage cans. And, um, and, and, one, and, and, and if you look back, there's a thrill. There's some kind of feeling you get when you're in the air and your heart is at a point where it's almost like falling back on a chair. And I love that feeling. I love pushing to the edge. You know, you climb a mountaintop, you must have that Maybe, feeling. All but you, all you, the time. You, you know, you, it, it's a feeling that gets you motivated. It gets you, clears your head, the clarity, your focus, everything comes into play, and it's a thrill. And um, I remember negotiating with Evil. I had him on the phone, and he says, Barry, why, why should I have you as my agent? Uh, who are you? And I started immediately talking about, you know, I represented Jackie Mason, got him a television show. I worked with Andy McDonald, world champion skateboarder. Um, uh, he goes, Andy McDonald, Tony Hawk, they're, you know, he, he downplayed it. Um, and I realized the point was, he doesn't care what I did. He, the, the, uh, so I had to say to him right away, I said, Evil, first of all, when I was 13 years old, you were my idol. I would take my Schwinn bicycle down the street and jump over these garbage cans the day that you were jumping on Saturday. Uh, and explain with... what Evil was jumping over. Uh, he was jumping maybe 15 cars that day. He had, you, you know, he was doing crazy events on WA on, on WABC here and yeah. on ABC Sports. Right. Um, and uh, the point was, he he says, "Yes, I did." And then he started talking for 15 minutes. And you know, um, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care about them and who they are. And that's who he was. And to, for me to talk about who I represented. It was more important to talk about why I was passionate and to be an honor to represent him in this deal. So that's what closed it. But, um, but going back to college years or your profession, when you set out on your profession, what did you set out to do? Well, I was, you know, you see a fold-up pen. I was selling fold-up sunglasses to pay partially through to go through school when I was right. younger. Um, uh, fold-up sunglasses, I come home, I was, I was in the office products industry for several years, you know, many years. I was a sales rep, sales manager, sales trainer. So um, you were selling these consumer items, something that an individual could use. Well, B2B was more the sunglasses, but copiers and uh, was uh, B2B. So, but you were still selling to people. Yes, You, you, you we were selling are, yes. w w with the purpose of getting someone to make a buy-in decision for the thing that you were representing. Correct. And even though they were products like a pen, a Xerox machine, whatever they may be, you were evolving in your career as a salesman. Did you contemplate agent, author, radio, or did something happen along the way that caused these additions to what you were doing? I, I think the, uh, the breakthrough came when I was selling, I was selling Monroe equipment, which was equivalent to Amita, uh, it had many, you know, and people would think I was selling shocks. It was a copier, you know, just Monroe. But we had a great service department, and I had to differentiate myself and sell against Xerox and Canon and others. Right. So what I would do is I would go to my customers, I would interview them on a tape recorder, and this is in the 80s, okay, and, and ask them why they bought from me, who they looked at, and what benefits they had since making the decision. I'd get audio testimonials with their letter head. They wrote a testimonial. And then whenever I get objections from people, I'd say, I appreciate that. I want you to talk to Susan or Steve. Ask them what it was like after the sale. What, what, what did you get? What kind of service? And I utilized those audio voice inflection testimonials back then, which made a huge difference, not in just the customer or the prospect seeing the, you know, the kind of success track record and the service you give, but also it in I got infused with passion because I was hearing my customers talk about the success I was doing. You wouldn't realize sometimes how powerful that is when you hear your own customer talk about the benefits they receive. So um, that, was, that was a breakthrough that um, I originally then, that was the first article I ever wrote in Selling Power magazine. With, and, uh, and from then on, it was... Uh, let, let me examine that moment because that, that, that is generally when I hear stories like that, that particular moment is something that takes your mind to a belief that you're capable potentially of something more than you even thought. Did that happen? I, I just like being creative. I, I believe that the customer, that was all about a lot of the sales books, is the customer's power of really listening and understanding them and going beneath the surface and really 
you know, you know, nobody cares. Again, what you do until you, when you find out what that customer is about, especially in business to business, uh, who they sell to, who's, what's their business like, what are their challenges, what are their goals, what are they trying to accomplish, and you get underneath the surface like nobody else does, you have a power to come back with that's, that's huge. Um, for seminars, I, I used to do something different. I would ask the customer for their top salespeople. Let's say it's 1,000 sales reps, 400, whatever it is, and they'd give me two or three. Then I'd interview those salespeople and I'd ask for some of their top customers. And the reason why I wanted to interview their customers is because they were sold to by the best of the best in that company. And I'd ask why they bought from them. You know, was price important? What did they do after the sale? What differentiated them? What added value? And the, and the information that came back to me educated me not only on that sales rep, but on that company and their product like never before. So I took it not just from the selling standpoint when you're selling a product to a company, but selling to a company where they have their own sales rep, the sales force, and really trying to create something powerful through those interviews. And the funny part is over thousands of interviews who created a book, the customer tells how to sell. It's almost, you know, sales secrets from your customers. But you created from this, you created much more than that. You created an entire enterprise for Barry Farber because next thing I knew, the first time I saw you was this television station people were talking about called QVC. So here you were selling. You were so good at it, you were able to teach others to do it. So if I remember, you ran a lot of seminars in a lot of places, but then all of a sudden an opportunity came up where you could be on television selling something. Tell us about how that worked. I actually had a show on Comcast where I interviewed an inventor, an inventor who came up with the granola bar. He invented uh, a diaper, a piece, a Band-Aid. Oh, you know, you take the little red stripe that opens the Band-Aid and make he's no, make brilliant. He, and he right. introduces me to somebody who says, this guy needs a little help. So I, I partnered up with somebody who had an idea about the Folds Flat Pen. And um, both of us together, uh, long story short, came up with a plastic uh, pen that folded flat. I saw it, I just immediately, my mind went crazy as a miniature billboard to put brands on, your name, business card, licensing, everything went crazy. But you know, you get all excited and believe it or not, in the beginning it was like 50, 100 rejections. People said it was a novelty, won't work. And it just fired me up because you talk about failure is not an option. If you believe in something deep down, you have to get past that. You have to realize that there's gonna be a lot of incoming negative comments and you have to go past it. So. Even QVC, when I called them with a metal version, uh, we had a gold and silver one. Oh, of they, the pen? Yes. They, she laughed. She goes, look, pens don't work on QVC. I said, well, if this pen doesn't work, I'll walk home from Pennsylvania. You know, I had a few. <laughs> I sort of said that. And, and uh, she oh, to, laughed. Oh, to New York. She laughed, which is a long walk, <laughs> that by is the a way. Long walk, and yeah. I would tell a long drive. That, believe me. I'd figure a way to promote that. <laughs> but um, it didn't. We sold out the first time. But, you know, there's another example, too, getting excited about this product is, there's so many things that happened from this. Even the failure within this opened up doors that I would have never had open if I didn't have this product. I want to examine that in just a second while we take a station identification. You're listening to A Climb to the Top, Stories of Transformation on Talk Radio 77 WABC. I'm Chuck Garcia, and my guest this evening is Barry Farber. Barry, what you're suggesting is you heard no, and you heard no, and there's obstacles and mountains in your way. I know in your book you teach a lot of those tactics. What would you do about all of this? You know, I trademarked no makes you go, but I don't know if that's a good thing to say these days. <laughs> I got to say, back then, no, no, seriously, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, when somebody says no to me and um, talking about a product that I believe in and that has value for the consumer or the company, that you have to think and sit and figure out ways to come back with a new idea, a different way. But more importantly, um, no's happen a lot because we don't understand who we're selling to. And, and so even in that... Uh, QVC meeting, you have a few minutes, you're sitting in a small room, and um, you could pull your product out and pitch right away. I didn't take the pen out. I just asked the question, I said, what, what are the two or three key things you look for when you invest in a product that sells out and does well on QVC? I wanted to understand from this buyer who's been there for many, many years, what she found is successful, and she shared with and, me. And this is also, let me preface that by them having told you, this isn't going to work, but what the heck? come and show. So already they're predisposed to pens don't work on QVC and you're turning this around. Well, she gave me a meeting and yep. we sat down and, and literally I think what happens, we don't realize how powerful the question is. That one question, what, I don't care what business you're in, what are the three key things you look for investing in an advertising program or investing in a insurance, whatever it might be, you know, working with a salesperson, a company, but she explained to me, look, 
What sells on QVC, it's got to be demonstrable. You've got to demonstrate it. It's got to wow the customer. It's got to be different. It's got, you know, and, and all the things that I had to listen to prior to showing, the, and then all I did was say, okay, I'm glad you said it. Here are th those three things. This is what this pen is, and just demonstrated it for her, showed her how there's nothing on the market like it. And uh, the wow factor is people just, the funny part is on QVC, they measure you by um, sales, like you, you can sit in the green room and watch people's sales go up and down. But as soon as I had the pen flat and I opened the metal one, you could see it in, on, on video, and, and I put it together, that transformation, that's when sales went crazy because people just were blown away by a simple, uh, you know, and, and in, in spite of the, the design flaw that made this thing click, that's the Disney story when they made the first Mickey Mouse at Shimmy or something like that. And people said, oh, my God, we can't put that movie out there. It's, it's Shimmy. And Walt Disney says, let it Shimmy. And it did. And people said, oh, my God, look at Mickey Mouse. It moves. That's really cool. We've never seen anything like that. That was a mistake. You just made a mistake. Mistakes are amazing. You, right. you, you take and what do you learn from those mistakes? Well, you learn that you you, you know you move on, and, and some of them you just got to eliminate any kind of uh, uh, information in your mind that says, oh well, you're not going, it's not working, it's not going to make it, whatever, and try to figure out a way to to, uh, to utilize that to make it. You can, people just can't stop snapping. They're snapping. <laughs> it's addicting, and I talk about it. Uh, you know, because it relieves stress. So as an example, you know, you could sit there and, I, and you hear it on the show, you hear the snapping. Right. Um, and, uh, you know. And for the listeners, if they're not watching us on a video, on, uh, there is the pen in my right and left hand, and you can mess with this, and you can make, and you can fold it, and you can make all kinds of clicking sounds, because this is not just a pen. This is much more than that. And it's not just a metaphor. When you put this in somebody's hands, what do you want them to do with it? Well, that's a, the key. Is that we, you know, when, when you the great thing about QVC was you you can demonstrate it on television; right. they can see it. But um, we have a company, the Pen Company of America, out of Garwood, New Jersey, that makes over 400 million pens a year, all made in the USA. And they, I took it from China, and now we make it there. And they're very ama they're, they're amazing. That's all they've done for pens for generations. And uh, They've uh, transformed this into great printing, great writing, refill, and um, you know, delivery is in like a week to 10 days versus uh, six weeks. Yeah, well, everyone else is busy thinking about how do I invent the app that's gonna make me a billion dollars, and here you are talking about a low-tech pen. What's, what's, the, what's, well, what's the lesson to our listeners? Well, the lesson is either you sell them in bunches, sell billions of them, because you've got to sell many, many of these plastic pens. So we're, you know, coming up with, I can't say on the show here, but a surprise will be coming soon. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> great. I want to shift for, for just a bit. Sure. One of the common themes, well, let me back up. We talked a little bit about the tactics that you use, say, speaking to somebody, try and make it their agenda, and figuring out what are the three things that are important to you. But there are two common themes in your book, in, in any of your books, in, in most of the literature. One of them is the removal of fear that comes by stepping into the things of the unknown, knowing you may fail. How do you help someone who is considering a career? And it could be sales. It could be acting. Anything where you show up and you've got to move someone to yes. Talk about how you get their personal stories to yes. What's your advice? Well, I, a lot of people are, are you know, fear blocks more people from success, from sales, from presenting. The biggest fear in the world is presenting to a group, you know, and, and I think, you know, you look at fear as an acronym. Somebody once told me this many, many years ago, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. And we look at something and we say, oh my God, this is going to be impossible. I can't do this. I never did this. And then you go do it. And you look back after and you say, that wasn't that bad. And you have to remind yourselves of that. But I'm a big believer in jumping in, too. Look, you know, there's a statement, and uh, it was Ross Perot who said it many years ago. He said, you know, there's some companies that say, ready, ready, aim, 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 and never fire the gun to take action. And he's like, ready, fire, aim. <laughs> right. And, and yeah, that, when that's you, the, the midshipman in him. I, I will say, preparation is important. I prepare for clients. You prepare for situations. Preparation gives you the confidence to stand up and do something because you're, you, you've spent the time to do that. But the action sometimes that you take in a fearful situation because you don't have all the information is 10 times more powerful. Um, martial arts has given me something that has saved my life, and I can tell you many ways it saved my life, but more so in the fact that it's made me look at things a little different. Actually, let's hold up on that. I, would do, I do want to examine that. I'm glad you did, because this martial arts is very much the embodiment of the physicality that you bring to what you do. You know, as salespeople, it is a very physical thing. Talk about how you 
Did you come to martial arts? Did it come to you and what it has done for you? I always loved martial arts as a kid. I made believe I knew all these skills and imagined myself, you know, fighting this bully in school, whatever it might be. I was the shortest kid in my class. I think it was in ninth grade. And but well, when you weren't hopping st- over 15 right, garbage you know, cans. That's, that's, what, that's <laughs> what my thrill was. But um, I started, I did, took Taekwondo, got a black belt there, did weapons training, Aikido, Jiu Jitsu, when uh, Shihan Mark Walker, uh, trained me and out of Newark, New Jersey, it was the greatest training in the world because he threw me on the mat. He got me to realize that falling isn't failing as long as you get back up. You can use it as a strike to understand how to roll on the ground and concrete on, on gravel and to be able to absorb things in a circular movement. Um, it doesn't just help you with martial arts, it helps you with life because when somebody throws an objection, an obstacle at you, you don't have to block it and attack them and start getting defensive. You can step aside and let it go through, through and say, wait a second, what is this obstacle? Is it important, is it not? Maybe let, them, let, let the person talk, maybe it's not. Maybe they just need to get it off their chest. So martial arts is in a tremendous uh, uh, training ground for life, not just for, you know, the funny thing is the more you learn, the less you want to fight. You, you realize it's, it's, it's such a mental ability. But in, in answering your question, you asked pri- previously to give somebody, how do I deal with fear, getting a job, trying sales, whatever it is. We learn from our actions and we act from our learning. One without the other suffers. Say that again. We, I, I want to plant that in the minds it's of our key listeners. Because yeah, say it. Everybody, one, one more time. We learn from our actions. Pause. And we act from our learning. Act from our learning. Love that. Expand on that. But one without the other suffers. Both together provides a clarity and truth. And the reason I say that is because when you're fearful, sometimes when you find somebody, a mentor, a wise advisor that you can connect with, or somebody, you know, a lot of my clients are my wise advisors. You don't realize how you build a relationship when you realize somebody has some information. You know, represent athletes, entertainers, business leaders, and, and, and those people give you information that you can learn from. You don't just have to, you know, you're, you're serving them, but at the same time, listening to them. And uh, I, I just feel that when we take too much action, we can sometimes get into a a brick wall and we have to step back and start reading, start looking into things and start, you know, educating ourselves. Commencement in high school and college, it's a speech, commencement speech, it means the beginning, not the end of learning. We should be learning like we're going to, you know, live forever and live like we're going to die tomorrow. I I believe in a a passionate thing about, you know, that action is what gets me excited because that's where I learn the most. And and I appreciate how important that action is. I think we, we can all agree on that. However, I think a lot of the action is born out of the intuition that we developed over time. And I'm getting the sense, I'd like your opinion on this, the more we have technology, I'm getting the sense as I teach some of the up-and-comers in my own coaching practice, they don't seem to have the same sense of intuition, not because it's not in them. I just don't think it's as well-developed because there's these other pieces of technology that are prohibiting that. Are you finding that? But, but to our intuition, because I think as salespeople, selling yourself, so much is drawn from no matter how much you prepare, you're in the moment now and somebody's throwing something you didn't expect happens all the time. Right. No plan ever survived, no battle plan ever survived the first shot. Your intuition and your ability to reflect, I'm finding is, I know for me, what got, what got me through it. But for you, I, I assume as well, how do you teach one to develop that intuition? Exactly. Chuck, you, you got it right on the money right there, because I think we underestimate the power of, and everybody uses the name, you know, being in the moment or, you know, I, I found the word motion. Uh, from martial arts means no mind and and you know mm. when you're sparring somebody and when you're training if you have to think about the kick that you're about to pull out to kick them in a certain spot you've already lost you can't think you, you know it's like Yogi Berra had a great quote he said how can anybody think and hit at the same time you know and and okay. and, and that motion part does not happen naturally it happens because all the things behind the scenes the training the preparation the constant hours of training where nobody sees what you're doing. Nobody sees the failures, the setbacks, the obstacles, the disappointments, the things that are behind the scenes until they see you succeed. And when, whether it's a sparring or, or a sales call or the most important presentation you're making, when you prepare like that and then you just speak from the heart, people connect with that. That's what they want to see. They want to see who you are. They don't want to just see a planned presentation, something that you put together and are just reading a script. Anybody can do that, but it's got to come organically from who you are and what you represent. And Let's use that as the ability to sum up, and I wish we had four hours for this show, Barry, but unfortunately, we only have a couple minutes left. We ask in every episode, in 
every one of our guests to examine the question, what do we want our listeners to think? What do we want them to feel? And what do we want them to do once Barry s- stops speaking? So let, let, let's begin at the top. From everything that you said, for all those people out there that could learn from you, and I won't call you a guru out of respect, what do you want the listeners to think about their careers and their potential transformations? I think going back to the fundamentals in life, the word fun is in fundamentals, which is funny because people think fundamentals are boring, you know, but uh, I find that, um, you know, I'll give you an example. I, I was training for a weapons competition and I would seriously on plane flights when I couldn't train, I would visualize that every single movement, I would watch a video of the best martial artist training with a bow staff and slow it down to one eighth the speed and, and, and look at every detail and train at two hours in the morning, two hours at night, anywhere, constantly in snow, rain, it doesn't matter. And what and, happened? And what do you want them to feel about their possibilities? Because that's what gives confidence. That's what gives you the ability to stand up and not think anymore and do what you are meant to do. You know, you think you stink. Uh, you know, you did it already. You should have done it way before that. Now what, that, get, that gets to the do. What do you want them to do with all of this? What do you? you the feel and the, you know, and yeah, the do. So, so <laughs> you got, I got the think, feel, and do. Yeah, I think it's cool the, what you make this show. I love your whole album. Uh, no, I, I appreciate it. it. Um, well, this is the call uh, to action uh, because uh, you've had many call to actions in your life. You have many things that led you to so many unexpected places. Many of our listeners don't know what that's going to be. But what we're teaching them, hopefully as faculty, we are teaching them sometimes don't think so much. Let your intuition. But now what do you do with it? When you talk well, about the action. What do okay. they do? I want them to follow their heart. I want them to follow a path with heart, something they believe in. Because when you get knocked down a lot, if you're trying to do something that's challenging, that's what keeps you going. That's what allows you to come back strong. Because if you don't believe in it, that's the most difficult thing in the world. And the second thing is to learn something new every day. What can I learn something? What can I learn that this today, did I learn anything? If I didn't learn something new, Every day, then, then, then I'm, I'm going backwards, you know? I mean, we have to get outside of our comfort level, and that's when a Navy SEAL uh, told me a great example of what's the key to success. He says to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Let's, let's leave it at that, to be comfortable being uncomfortable. You have tuned in to A Climb to the Top, Stories of Transformation. I'm Chuck Garcia. My guest this evening was Barry Farber. Barry, thank you very much for coming into the studio. Chuck, you're a great host, a great show. Congratulations and wish you continued success. No, I really appreciate it. And to our listeners, thank you as always for tuning in and good night. We're 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 gonna we're we're gonna continue on. Wow, that, we got a couple minutes. Whatever um, you so, need. So now the radio show is done. But let's. I I want to take. I want to examine the martial arts thing for it because I love the metaphor in life. Um, at what age did you come to martial arts? I don't know. Like Thirty. Was it young. Oh, it was no, your no, adult no. life. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Why didn't you get to it earlier? Um. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think. It, was I think it, what did it choose you? Were you? Um, I, I need to do something outside just, of the realm of sales because you, you're a busy dude. I just decided um, to take a Taekwondo class, and I got a kick out of it. You know, and the funny thing is, we, we would train, and 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 I would just love to just go like ballistic. To the point where you can't breathe. Let it all out. Like I just because I did read a lot of martial arts masters, Bruce Lee and others, and and um, what 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 motivated me was that the, the the concept of doing something where you're almost getting dizzy and you're going to faint. That's how far you go. Where other people in the class, somebody hey, take it easy, Barry. We don't want to go crazy, but it's almost like my son playing ba- baseball, and so, and he would be the first one to run out. To the field and the empires would give him compliments. He'd tear out there, even no matter if, if the if the teammate said something like, "What are you doing that for? Just take it," you know, you know. He just, you know, uh, all out, all, all out. in, all out. Because you 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 know, Bruce Lee. I just remember reading all his material and just talking about the point of exertion, where you're not just okay. I, can, I don't need to go anymore. I might hurt myself. Not that I'm going to hurt myself, but I want to go to the point where the next time I go, I pass the threshold. You talk about climbing to the top. How do you get past that threshold? You don't do it taking it easy. You have to push yourself to a point where you're comfortable uh, going to the edge. Well, it's an interesting parallel, Barry, because you and I grew up in very similar worlds. If we had to sell something, in my case, it was Bloomberg and BlackRock, but it was a service. 
and you had to convince someone. So you had to inspire them to think differently. You had to persuade them to open up their checkbook, which is a hard thing to do. And then you had to provoke a change in the way they thought about you because they weren't just buying the pen. They were buying the guy behind the pen. Yet we both found, I found mountain climbing at 42. You found martial arts in, the, in your early 30s. But I think we've spent so much of our careers in this mental game that is so much more physical than anyone realizes. Like with acting. When we watch those actors, it's the integration of the mind and the physicality that they bring to it. Mm -hmm. You teach, and I've seen your, in your videos, the physicality of audience engagement. There's a physical thing that you bring into the martial arts. Do you think maybe that's why it was calling to you? <laughs> I just, I remember uh, a lot of times I would roll on stage and just do a flip land on my back and slap it out and just get, you know, talk about the point of a message that takes people to a clarity of like, here's the message. You're gonna try things that are different and you're gonna try things that are new and you're gonna get beat up a little bit in the first right. time. Take the punch. But get back up, try it again, try it differently, try customize it your own way. Uh, you know, Bruce Lee said, collect, discard, and create. You know, collect information, discard what's not useful, and then create your own style. Be who yeah, you are. That's, that's what's important. Collect, um, discard, create. But the most amazing message that I've had, um, which is almost a contradiction in terms here about, you know, goal setting and passion and focus and you want to get to the top, is a statement called, um, it's, it's from, you know, martial arts, it's from Tao, it's from different sayings, but it's, what I came to think is this, those who desire nothing possess everything. Yeah, very, now, very it's a hard thing to say. It's like, what do you mean? Those who desire nothing possess everything. You don't, you, you, how could you have not have a passion? But when you go into a sales call, I like to use sales call because of your yeah, background and right. so forth, but, um, and, and you don't need that business. You are there for that client in a different way than if you need to get that because either you're going to be fired or you're not going to get that trip or whatever is the back of your mind. Point. Uh, the selling from the aspect of the customer's point of view and listening to them or anything in life. Because once you don't care about that, you, you care more about what you're impacting. You know what I'm saying? Those who yeah. well, desire... I, I, you know. I learned as a little kid, you know, you, you know who the bullies are, but what I learned is never pick a fight with someone who has nothing to lose. <laughs> And, and, and right, that, that's what you're describing. But as we in our professions, and we had an actor on this show who said the same thing. She showed up to auditions, and when she was indifferent to the auditions, those are the ones she got. Absolutely. And the other ones, it got too much into her head. She wanted it too much. And she said, I'm serving the wrong person when I'm in my head. To your point, you're serving the customer, not yourself. Mm -hmm. And when your mindset is directed outward, that's when the success happens. Right. And, and when you, when you start thinking to yourself that the, I'm not trying to grab, I got to get this. Once you start to try to grab, it gets away from your grasp. Right. Once you sit back, it's, it's not like people should just sit back and people will come to them because you still have to have massive action to learn from that. But at the same point, if you don't have the massive action, work ethic, time behind the scenes that you're doing things, you won't have that attitude of sitting back when you're having a meeting and realizing that you don't need something so bad that you're going to interfere with the whole process of understanding who you're selling to or who you're dealing with. Right. All right. Let's, let's finish up with Barry. You've done so many cool things and represented some pretty cool people. What's, what's the mountain ahead? What's, what are you thinking? Well, I have a client who has a film that we're working on. We did a book for him. He was a sports agent. Uh, he's one of the biggest real estate developers in Florida, but he has a passion for business like I've never seen anybody. I've known him many, many years. Hmm. But his ability to go past adversity, go past the nose, and make it motivate him, he's been one of my greatest mentors. And you'll be seeing something interesting that compares to beyond Wolf of Wall Street in a situation where somebody's uh, passion, work ethic, loyalty, devotion um, gets him over obstacles that uh, people would say, that's impossible, how did he do that? And you're, you're working on the film? What's the role that you play? Um, a co-agent. Oh, you're, you're an agent. Okay, mm -hmm. so you're, you're in the representation stage of yes. this, this project. Okay, so looking ahead, movie or agent, um, you're still writing books? Not do you anymore. have time? <laughs> no, I, I, I do write a column for local magazines and, and sometimes Inc. and Entrepreneur. But, right. Um, yeah, that's, in fact, that's where I first saw your name in one of those articles. Oh, Barry. And then I, I went to everything else and right. 
That was, was a long You got it right. You got to, pro yeah. you know, produce or perish, uh, publish or perish. You know, yeah. there's one thing about writing a column that you have to sit down and think about the content, the takeaways, the intro, the summary, and, and, and it also allows me to interview people too, like you do. Yeah. It's a great platform to be able to get educated again without paying for it. Right. No, indeed. Well, Barry, this is a, um, a real pleasure. Yes, and, likewise. And we are, we are blessed for, on behalf of my producing partners. We're really glad you came into the studio. We're gonna t we've got plenty of other things, our communication lines wide open, and to our listeners and to the ones who are watching us, thank you very much. Please, I would recommend any of Barry's books, but here is a good one, Success. Success is, in, in, is within the, the boundaries of this book, and we are really honored to have had him here. Good night. <laughs>